the farmers were from the Czech side of my family, uh, uh, and they were they were farmers uh, in Bohemia and uh, came to America and, and continued uh, dairy farming. My my German side, uh, uh, they were factory workers, uh, uh, peasants essentially. Uh, know very little about particularly my grandfather on my father's side. Even my father knew knew little about his life before America. This first poem is called Wife Hits Moose. It's a fairly early poem or in the, from the early 80s. Wife Hits Moose. Sometime around dusk, Moose lifts his heavy primordial jaw dripping from pond water and without psychic struggle, decides the day for him is done. Time to go somewhere else. Meanwhile, wife drives one of those roads that cut straight north, a highway dividing the forests not yet fat enough for the paper companies. This time of year, full dark falls about eight o'clock. Pine forest and black top blend. Moose reaches road, fails to look both ways, steps deliberately, ponderously. Wife hits moose hard at a slight angle, brake slam, car spinning, and moose rolls over hood, antlers as if diamond tip, scratch windshield, car damaged. Rib of moose imprint on fender, hoof shatters headlight. Annoyed moose lands on feet and walks away. Wife is shaken, unhurt, amazed. Does moose believe in a supreme intelligence? Speaker does not know. Does wife believe in a supreme intelligence? Speaker assumes as much spiritual intimacies being between the spirit and the human. Does speaker believe in a supreme intelligence? Yes, thank you. It's a, a short little poem, a rhyming, rhymed and meter, a meter poem called A Little Tooth about my daughter. Your baby grows a tooth, then two, and four, and five, then she wants some meat directly from the bone. It's all over. She'll learn some words, she'll fall in love with cretins, dolts, a sweet talker on its way to jail. And you, your wife, get old, fly blown, and rue nothing. You did, you loved, your feet are sore, it's dusk. Your daughter's tall. This is called The People of the Other Village. The people of the other village hate the people of this village and would nail our hats to our heads for refusing in their presence to remove them or staple our hands to our foreheads for refusing to salute them if we did not hurt them first. Mail them packages of rats. Mix their flour at night with broken glass. We do this, they do that. They peel the larynx from one of our brother's throats. We devein one of their sisters. The quicksand pits they built were good. Our amputation teams were better. We trained some birds to steal their wheat. They sent to us exploding ambassadors apiece. They do this, we do that. We canceled our sheep imports. They no longer bought our blankets. We mocked their greatest poet, and when that had no effect, we parodied the way they danced which did cause pain. So they, in turn, said our God was leprous, hairless. We do this, they do that. 10,000, 10,000 years, 10,000, 10,000 brutal, beautiful years. This poem is called An Horatian Notion. Uh, Horace, the great Latin uh, poet, 
said that poems are made uh, things. They don't just come down our arms. They're made things. And this is a, a poem that agrees with uh, Horace on that. And it's a kind of ars poetica. The thing gets made, gets built. And you're the slave who rolls the log beneath the block, then another, then pushes the block, then pulls a log from the rear back to the front again, and then again it goes beneath the block, and so on. It's how a thing gets made. Not because you're sensitive or you get genetic lucky or God says, here's a nice family, seven children. Let's see, this one in charge of the village Dunghill. These two die of buboes. This one, Kierkegaard. Uh, this one, a drooling nincompoop. This one, clerk. This one, Cooper. No, you need to love the thing you do. Bird house building, painting tulips exclusively, whatever. And then you do it so consciously driven by your unconscious that the thing becomes a wedge that splits a stone and between the halves the wedge then grows. I.e., the thing is solid but with a soul, a life of its own. Inspiration, the, the nay, the gift, the bolt, the fire down the arm that makes the art. Grow up. Give me, please, a break. You make the thing because you love the thing. And you love the thing because someone else loved it enough to make you love it. And with that, your heart, like a tent peg, pounded towards the earth's core. And with that, your heart on a beam burns through the ionosphere. And with that, you go to work. This poem is called, I Love You, Sweatheart. Uh, I saw this piece of graffiti uh, on a very inaccessible uh, overpass uh, a bridge in uh, North Carolina. I love you, sweatheart. <coughs> a man risked his life to write the words. A man hung upside down, an idiot friend holding his legs with spray paint to write the words on a girder 50 feet above a highway. And his beloved, the next morning, driving to work. His words are not meant to be so unique. Does she recognize his handwriting? Did he hint to her at her doorstep the night before of something special, darling, tomorrow? And did he call her at work, expecting her to faint with delight at his celebration of her, his passion, his risk? She will know I love her now. The world will know my love for her. A man risked his life to write the words. Love is like this at the bone. We hope love is like this, sweetheart. All sore and dumb and dangerous, ignited, blessed, always. Regardless, no exceptions, always in blazing matters like these, blessed. This is called Refrigerator 1957. I'm thinking of those giant old refrigerators uh, that used to exist. More like a vault. You pull the handle out, and on the shelves, not a lot. And what there is, a boiled potato in a bag, a chicken carcass under foil, looking dispirited, drained, mugged. This is not a place to go in hope or hunger. But just to the right of the middle Door shelf on fire, a lit from within red, heart red, sexual red, wet neon red, shining red in their liquid, exotic, aloof, slumming in such company, a jar of maraschino cherries. Three quarters full, fiery globes like strippers at a church social, maraschino cherries. Maraschino, the only foreign word I knew. Not once 
did I see these cherries employed, not in a drink, nor on top of a glob of ice cream, or just pop one in your mouth, not once. The same jar there through an entire childhood of dull dinners, bald meat, pocked peas, and, see above, boiled potatoes. Maybe they came over from the old country, family heirlooms, or were status symbols bought with a piece of the first paycheck from a sweatshop which beat the pig farm in Bohemia, handed down from my grandparents to my parents to be someday mine than my child's? They were beautiful, and if I never ate one, it was because I knew it might be missed, or because I knew it would not be replaced, and because you do not eat that which rips your heart with joy. I'm reading these poems kind of consecutively or uh, chronologically, and now I think we're in the, in the earlier, the mid-90s. This is called Cucumber Fields Crossed by High Tension Wires. The high tension spires spike the sky, beneath which boys bend to, prick, to pick from prickly vines the deep sopped fruit. The rinds green, a green sunk in green. They part the plant's leaves, reach into the nest, and pull out mother, father, fat Uncle Phil. The smaller, yellow-green children stay, for now. The fruit goes in baskets by the side of the row, every thirty feet or so. By these bushels, the boys get paid in cash, at day's end, this summer of the last days of the empire that will become known as the past, adios, then, the ragged, edged, beautiful blink. This is another uh, fairly short poem called Plague Victims Catapulted Over Walls into Besieged City. Early germ warfare. The dead hurled this way turn like wheels in the sky. Look, there goes Larry the shoemaker, barefoot, over the wall. And Mary's sausage stuffer, see how she flies. And the Hatter twins, both at once, soar over the parapet. Little Tommy's elbow bent as if in a salute. And his sister, Matilda, she follows him, arms outstretched through the air, just as she did on earth. I'll finish the reading with a poem called Tarantulas on the Life Buoy. I was, uh, I was on an island once, uh, and there was only one swimming pool on the island. And uh, the people there, I still don't know if they're pulling my leg or not, uh, said to me, uh, uh, whenever it rains on this island, all of the tarantulas on the island get washed into this swimming pool. Uh, this one swimming pool at this one crummy hotel where I was on, on this island. Uh, when anybody, if, if anybody says to a poet something like tarantulas uh, in a swimming pool, uh, and if a poet passes up the opportunity to try to try to do something with that, uh, we should turn in our our, uh, our poetic licenses. Tarantulas on the life buoy. For some semi-tropical reason, when the rains fall relentlessly, they fall into swimming pools, these otherwise bright and scary arachnids. They can swim a little, but not for long, and they can't climb the ladder out. They usually drown, but if you want their favor, if you believe there is justice in a reward for not loving the death of ugly and even dangerous the eel, hog, snake, rats, creatures. If you believe these things, then you would leave a life buoy or two in your swimming pool at night. And in the morning, you would haul ashore the huddled, hairy survivors and escort them back to the bush. And no, be assured that at least 
these saved as individuals would not turn up again someday in your hat, drawer, or the tangled underworld of your socks, and that even when your belief in dreams merges with your belief in justice, they may tell the others in a sign language four times as subtle and complicated as man's that you are good, that you love them, that you would save them again. How did you discover poetry growing up on a dairy farm? You know, that's a, that's a good question. I really didn't when I was a child, although I remember specific things from like uh, uh, junior high school, uh, maybe early in high school. I remember having an assignment in, in seventh grade to write a poem. I don't remember another thing about seventh grade. Uh, I remember my mother helped me with this uh, poem. I remember a uh, seventh or eighth grade teacher uh, explaining Anamata uh, Pia, because uh, I remember he went, uh, uh, puke, uh, that's an example of Anamata Pia. Uh, I remember uh, I remember seeing Robert Frost on, on, on TV at, uh, in Kennedy's uh, inauguration, uh, but I, I had no idea that there, other than Mr. Frost, that there were any living poets uh, in America uh, there was certainly no en encouragement to write or read uh, poetry in high school. Uh, I did read a huge amount of uh, uh, fiction, particularly in, in, in high school and maybe starting in, in junior uh, high school, but uh, I didn't really discover uh, poet that there was a contemporary poetry, that poetry the poets were actually alive and living today until my freshman year in college when I was uh, in Boston and they had bookstores that had poetry. And, in Boston, and then I started uh, taking classes, etc. But uh, I sort of knew in the back of my head there was something about this because I remember those specific incidences, but uh, but I had no idea what it meant. I, uh, I had no idea that that it would turn into certainly uh, writing poems. And at that stage, which poets did you come across and connect with? Well, the very first ones uh, in in college. Uh, uh, would have been uh, poets like Robert Lowell and uh, Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton, uh, uh, those poets. Uh, very shortly thereafter, James Wright, uh, Robert Bly, the so-called deep images, uh, Galway Cannell a little bit uh, later uh, than that, uh, Adrian Rich, uh, uh, Denise Levertoff, uh, 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 I remember Certain, certain books were uh, carried around, books all the time. Diane McCoskey's Inside the Blood Factory, uh, I remember carrying around uh, in, in my pocket. There was an anthology called Modern European Poetry. It was probably the single most important book to me uh, in my early 20s because all of a sudden all these foreign poets were available in translation that I didn't even know existed. Uh, and uh, I have a, there's a picture on my, the back of my first book and I, that I can see that anthology in my jacket uh, pocket. Nobody else can tell what it is, but I knew it was that, that anthology. Uh, and just kept discovering more and more. I was lucky to have a, a, a terrific undergraduate teacher, a woman named Helen Chasen, who had won the Yale uh, Younger Poets Award. And uh, she was very rigorous. Uh, uh, she, she, she beat the, some of the early elements of the craft into us. But she was also very uh, nurturing and, and generous uh, to, to me and, and other uh, students. So she was a, a very important first uh, uh, influence uh, teacher of mine, probably the first teacher who ever uh, noticed that I might have some kind of ability uh, in, in writing poems. And you started out as a neo-surrealist. Did some of that come from those European poets? Probably, and also, yeah, sure, probably the, the French uh, surrealists. But also the, uh, uh, the Latin American poets, uh, Vallejo and uh, uh, Neruda, uh, I was more attracted to the uh, South American, Latin American uh, form of surrealism than I was to the French uh, uh, surrealism. It seemed to me earthier and not quite as arbitrary as uh, French surrealism. Although I just love surrealism. I think it's a young, young poet's uh, game, particularly surrealism. I think it appeals I think it's irreverence, it's, it's kind of wildness, it's, it's goofiness. I think it appeals to young, uh, maybe particularly young men poets, I don't know. 
And it was, I don't know, it was kind of trendy in the 70s when I started writing poetry that the poets that I, uh, the younger poets that I was attracted to, like James Tate or uh, Bill Knott or uh, Charlie, Charles Simic, uh, they, all, uh, they, they all were uh, surrealists or, or, or borderline or uh, neo-surrealists. Somebody just put that, like all oh, the labels, deep image, whatever, that's somebody put that label on, on a group of poets sometime after the, after the fact. Uh, um, I don't. I, I remember being called that a, a couple times in, in print, but uh, but it was just a, it was just a, it was just a term that really didn't mean all that much. I don't think. Uh, but I I like to say uh, half jokingly that I'm uh, a recovering surrealist. You know, uh, there's still elements of surrealism. I guess you could argue that are in my poems. Uh, where's the line between a an, an imaginative metaphor and, uh, and a kind of wild, uh, almost arbitrary uh, image of uh, surrealism. I think what eventually uh, uh, turned me away from surrealism was, it, was the arbitrariness of it. Uh, it was just, it was too arbitrary, uh, too automatic, uh, not enough uh, attention, uh, too just uh, unconscious uh, uh, on the page. Uh, but I'd like to think that I, I still am a highly imaginative poet and, and uh, utilize metaphor uh, a, a, a great deal. But uh, I, I certainly wouldn't call myself a surrealist anymore. I still love their poetry and I teach them. And uh, Robert uh, Desnos is probably my favorite of the surrealist uh, poets. And then uh, Cesar Vallejo of the, of the uh, South American. Surrealist. You, you said you read fiction. Were the Latin American novelists also an influence? Uh, I'm not so sure the Americans, but more the Russians. Uh, I remember reading uh, between my, I think it was between my sophomore and junior uh, year of high school, reading uh, almost all of Dostoevsky and uh, going back in my beginning of my junior year and looking around all my classmates in some kind of big assembly and wondering. You know, how, did any of these people know about Raskolnikov? Or uh, I remember feeling lonely because like, I'd spent the whole summer uh, immersed in, in Dostoevsky, and then I read Tolstoy and uh, and, and Turgenev and you know, Chekhov, of course, and, and lots of the other uh, Russian poets, American poets too, of course, Hemingway and, and, and Fitzgerald. I remember staying up all night one night reading uh, The Great Gatsby, and my father walking by my room in the in the morning and and seeing me uh, wide awake reading a novel and thinking I was sick or something like that. Uh, so I read pretty much constantly and pretty much everything, but there wasn't, there wasn't anybody when I was in high school or, or say before college uh, that, that could recommend books to me, that, uh, that, that read books. There were no books in my house, in my parents' house. Uh, my parents were both readers, but they read kind of, uh, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, uh, it wasn't literature. They, they read a lot, but it wasn't uh, literature. Uh, I had an aunt who was an English teacher, and I remember that she recommended to me uh, uh, The Old Man in the Sea and lo loaned me a copy of that. Uh, a cousin that loaned me a copy of uh, uh, Catcher in the Rye, uh, things like, like that. But there was really nobody who could, uh, who, who guided. I had a high school Latin teacher uh, who just encouraged us to read. Uh, read novels, uh, just to read. I don't, I don't remember anybody else saying this is important, to read, to read books. You know, mostly in those days, there were no bookstores in my town. The, the only places you'd get a book was on a rack, like in a, like a newspaper store, and, they, and they were just paperbacks, and they'd have the uh, classics, uh, but, uh, but very, very little contemporary uh, things. And, my father was a milkman. I'd help him on Saturdays deliver milk. And when we stopped at one of these stores, uh, I guess that was the way he paid me. He he let me buy a, or he bought me a book uh, at, at at this particular store uh, every every Saturday. But they were just, you know, they were the the classics. Uh, okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs> and this is my new book, which which I love. I love the the cover of this book. Thanks to Neil for publishing it. Thank you.